it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Agent in the Woods My grandfather owned a cabin close to a lake. Apart from that, he was essentially in the middle of nowhere. A bit of a walk to a town, and the cell reception was nearly non-existent. Well, he took a bad fall and broke his hip near the start of the summer, and the entire small town nearby heard about it. Everyone was aware that he'd be in the hospital for a while, and, well, he didn't want the teenagers getting any ideas about breaking into his place, or using his land as somewhere to party while he was gone. And, somehow, I was seen as the most trustworthy out of all of his grandchildren. The cabin didn't have the best of internet connections, but I still took up on his offer to house-sit until he literally got back on his feet. Well, I'd never been the type for camping or any outdoor activities. Well, the cabin nearly changed my mind on that. Oh, the air was clean, and it was quiet. I never realized how much background noise I'd adjusted to while living in the city until it was gone. So I spent the first day cleaning and taking a trip into town to make sure my food was stocked up. My grandfather seemed to be falling behind with chores before he went to the hospital, and it was clear he may need to leave in an assisted living home soon. Well, he'd hate that, but I didn't want him to die alone in this cabin. Maybe I'd stay here longer with him when he came back. Well, if he'd have me. And I was between jobs and had the spare time. By the end of the day, I was exhausted from washing every surface of the thick layers of dust. I'd even washed all the blankets, fearing what kind of insects decided to overtake them while my grandfather had neglected the washing. So, because I was so tired, I barely woke up when I thought I'd heard something coming from the woods. Sounds of cars driving down the dirt road that led to hiking trails further into the woods. Well, the road was nearby the cabin, but so few cars passed by it that it wasn't an issue. So I chalked it up to phantom noises. <laughs> I was used to hearing cars at night, so my brain was filled in the blanks. Well, I didn't even question the fact that that night I heard more cars going down the road than had gone down it in months. But the next morning, I ate a small breakfast of toast and headed out for a short walk. A friend of mine was an artist of some sort. Before I left, he'd begged me to take as many photos of the woods as possible for reference photos that he could use for an upcoming project. And, well, uh, if I didn't get on it right away, I'd forget. So, yawning, I stayed within sight of the cabin, not to get lost. When I came across this dirt road, I paused, staring at all the tracks in the dusty road. And my mind went back to all those cars I'd heard that night. I looked up and down the road, trying to think of any reason why so many cars would pass through. A lost person, maybe. I was about to dismiss them as old tracks, and my mind just playing tricks on me, when I saw an SUV somewhat hidden down the road. It was parked off to the side. It was a car that looked like those FBI SUVs I saw on TV. And so, I couldn't help myself. I started to walk towards the SUV, curious. Someone might have gotten a flat or run out of gas. I wasn't snooping, I was helping. But getting closer, I started to feel off about the entire thing. The SUV was clean as a whistle, and it looked so out of place in these woods. I raised my camera to get a shot of it when I was only a few feet away. The license plate had no hint of what state the SUV had come from. Only the numbers 202. Well, this was totally weird. I snagged a quick photo, feeling a little bit guilty for some reason. This would make a great story when my grandfather came back. And the idea came to me. If this was a government issue vehicle, or part of law enforcement, then maybe all those cars last night were cop cars. What if they were hot on the case of some bodies scattered around in the woods? I'd listened to enough true crime podcasts to figure this sort of thing did happen. This would make a very great story when my grandfather came back. 
Well, I wanted to explore a little bit more, but I knew I'd get lost if I went too far into the woods. Spotting a trail near where the SUV had parked, I looked up and down the road as if I was committing a crime. <laughs> I followed the path, though, camera at the ready in case I discovered something. I found two things out very quickly. First, I was not made for hiking, and the woods were creepy as heck. The sea of trees just expanded forwards as sweat dripped down my face. I didn't even walk very far, but the trail was on an incline, so it made walking a bit difficult. I heard some birds chirping, but I could have sworn that when I started on the path, I'd heard something else. A rustling, almost clicking sound I thought was leaves in the wind. I started towards the sound, trying to figure out what it was. Well, it just sounded off enough for me to know that it wasn't a natural forest sound. When the sweat started to sting my eyes too much, I stopped to catch my breath and take a break. And that's when I realized I was lost. Looking down, I was no longer on a real trail, just relatively clear ground that one could mistake for a trail. In my panic, I looked around, trying to see where I'd gone wrong. The wind blew, calling me off a little as the clicking sound got closer and closer, as if whatever was making it was moving towards me. My heart was about to beat out of my chest when I felt something on my shoulder. I let out a shill scream and jumped, only to be held down by a large hand on my shoulder. Heart still pounding, throat dry, I looked up at the person who grabbed me. I was staring directly into a pair of sunglasses. I slowly looked over the new person, trying to calm down. He was a head taller than me and wearing a suit. A suit in the forest. He looked like he belonged with that SUV I'd seen earlier. His expression was neutral, but I could tell he wasn't pleased by me being in the woods. I... I'm lost, I admitted weakly. Without saying a word, he started to guide me along with his hand still clasped on my shoulder. I was freaking out, but trying to at least look calm. This guy reeked of secret government agent. He had the sunglasses and just needed an earpiece radio to complete the set. My guess about people looking for bodies in the woods might be right. But, well, why would he be wearing a suit? Surely they were allowed to change their clothing while on different tasks out in the field. I suddenly got the case of the giggles because of all the stress, and also because my last name was Anderson. I was being forced along by my very own Agent Smith. Sorry, just... Well, I was thinking The Matrix. You know, the uh, Mr. Anderson line. If your name was Smith and you said that to me, it'd be perfect, because it's my last name. Well, I was nervously rambling, saying the first thing that came to mind. You're not Smith. You must be Agent 202. Hearing that, he froze. His grip tightened almost to the point that it hurt. I'd never been so scared in my life before. Lost in the woods with a strange agent that could do anything to me and no one would ever find out. I looked up at him, his emotionless face now creased in stress, eyes still hidden behind his glasses. How did you know my name? He asked, and I was taken aback by how calm and soft his voice was. I was expecting some gruff military type. Uh, your car? I sputtered, not being able to finish my thought. Well, it really was just a guess that his codename would match what the SUV was labelled. His face eased up and I felt his grip on my shoulder relax. In fact, he almost looked embarrassed. He, um... Stay out of the woods for a few days, he warned, trying his best to sound stern. We didn't talk the rest of the way back. When we got back on the path, he still kept a hand on my shoulder, as if I was a child ready to bolt at any second. He might just want to be very sure I wasn't going to get lost again. When we got out of the woods and onto the road, he finally released me from his grasp. My heart was pounding the entire time. 
I felt a mixture of fear and embarrassment, even though I'd done nothing wrong. I was about to make a run for it when he held out his hand. It took me a few moments to figure out what he wanted. I looked down at my camera and back towards him. Bringing it closer towards me for protection, I didn't want to give it to him. Look, I uh, just want to delete the photo of the SUV that you took, he told me, hand still outstretched. I, how did you know I took one? Were you watching me the entire time? I asked, eyeing him. No, you just admitted it. Please let me delete the photo, and you can have your camera back. Reluctantly, I relented. It was mostly because he asked me so nicely, and also I didn't want to be arrested and tossed into some prison without a trial for messing in government affairs. True to his word... He flipped through the photos and deleted the one of his SUV. And oddly enough, he deleted one more of just trees that I'd taken before I realized I was lost. Oh, uh, my finger slipped, he said when he noticed me watching him delete one extra photo. That was a clear lie, and I didn't have the guts to call him out. So, uh, what's going on? Tracking down some bodies? Looking for a killer? Oh, oh aliens? I asked carefully. He didn't look like he enjoyed my sense of humor. Aliens. He said it in such a straightforward tone that I almost believed him. I finally smiled, feeling the stress of getting lost and bumping into him ease slightly. Turning away from me, he started back towards his parked SUV, gave me a small wave without looking back. Stay out of the woods for a few days, he warned again. I watched as he got into his car, then left me on the dirt road full of questions. My mind buzzing, I went back to the cabin to see I was only lost for a few hours and it wasn't even noon yet. Sitting down, I found it impossible to focus on anything but trying to solve the mystery of what was going on. The internet at the cabin was slower than molasses, so I went into town to use the library computer maybe grill the locals, if they'd noticed anything strange lately. I spent most of the afternoon looking things up to find no local legends or strange events. I dropped by the diner for supper, and not a soul had seen any black SUVs around or any man in black prowling the woods. Well, aside from finding out that the diner served the world's best meatloaf, my day had turned up nothing. I might even have let the entire thing drop. If something hadn't gotten inside the cabin that night. I was exhausted a second night in a row. And fear does that to you. I still felt a bit jittery, but passed out into deep sleep shortly after settling in. But in the dead of night, I felt myself coming out of a dream, confused on what had woken me up. I sat up, still half asleep, trying to focus. It was pitch dark, and I fumbled around for the lamp beside the bed. Listening, I thought I heard some noise coming from downstairs. It was hard to hear over the beating of my own thumping heart. Grabbing the flashlight from the dresser beside the bed, I gathered up my courage to go down and check it out. When I prayed, it was just a raccoon that had somehow gotten inside to get the Twinkies I'd bought earlier. More clattering came from the kitchen, which made me free. I clutched the flashlight against my chest as if it could protect me. Creeping down the stairs, I was aware of the noise my own clothing was making and every creak of the wood. It felt like it took me hours to finally get to the bottom of the steps. Tiptoeing, I kept going towards the kitchen. There was no door and I kept the flashlight down so as to not alert whatever or whoever was inside the kitchen. Pots and pans came clattering down, and it nearly made me run for it. Oh, this sounded much bigger than some hungry raccoon. My hands were shaking as I raised the light, trying to see what was rooting around in the cupboards. Raising the flashlight, I pointed it into the dark room, not seeing anything at first. A flurry of motion then came from the top cupboard. A dark shape came crashing down, knocking over chairs and tipping over the table. I couldn't match the silhouette to any animal I was aware of. 
Scratches were left behind in the hardwood floor, and the creature rushed out, nearly knocking out the back door from its frame. And I was not going to chase after it. God, I almost wet myself. After all, I was a city person. Wild animals breaking into my place in the middle of the night was not what I normally had to deal with. Not knowing what to do, I called the cops, begging them to come over and look over the damage. Two officers came by about an hour later. I turned on all the lights, but didn't dare go into the kitchen. They both looked a bit annoyed, having to come over in the dead of the night, but I could also tell the trip was slightly better than a boring night shift. They humoured me by looking over my invaded kitchen area. Can you describe this animal? One of the officers asked, while carefully stepping over a fallen pan. It was, um, really dark, I said, being very unhelpful. Big? Small. Flying around. Um, big-ish. Like, bigger than a house cat. I don't know about anything that would make marks like this, though. We all looked at the deep scratch marks left in the hardwood flooring and the countertops. Four long gouges scarred the wood, along with some long, single cuts into the wood. I looked over my food, and the only thing I was missing was a box of table salt. I wasn't aware the cabin already had an open box of salt before I'd bought some more, and the open box was knocked over, spilling over the counter. The stolen box was punctured by whatever took it and left a trail of salt behind. Well, aside from minor damage, it didn't look all that serious. I almost felt embarrassed having called them. Almost. How do you think it got inside? I asked, looking at the still open back door. Our oh, raccoons have hands, the younger cop commented. We all stood in silence for a while, till all three of us burst out laughing. Uh, the mental image of a raccoon breaking into and opening the back door was just too much for us. Uh, at least the cops weren't angry about the city guy calling them down in the middle of the night for nothing. Look, you uh, must have just forgotten to lock your back door. These raccoons are smart around here. You should be thankful you don't need a rabies shot right now. I agreed with them. We fixed the back door the best we could for the moment. One of them gave me a number of their brother who could swing by and repair my door the next afternoon. And so we all decided a raccoon was the culprit. But none of us wanted to talk about how a raccoon could do so much damage to the door. I thanked them again for the help and sent them on their way. I still didn't turn the lights off to sleep that night. Well, I was pretty worn out from that exciting night. I took a nap before I called for the back door to be repaired. Well, it didn't take very long, considering. And the repairman even let me pay him in two six-packs, which was very fair. With my only chore of the day accomplished, I couldn't help myself. I followed the tracks whatever animal had left behind in the night straight to the tree line. I debated on what to do. I could easily get lost if I kept following the tracks inside the woods. Well, the warning the agent had given me still rang through my mind. A thought came to me. Well, maybe he was still around. Yes, I did want to believe that a raccoon had broken in to steal my salt, but on the off chance it wasn't a raccoon, I wanted to see if he'd spill the beans on what exactly was going on in these woods. I didn't have any way of finding him, though. While making up my mind, I figured just walking down the road wouldn't do any harm. I might get lucky and spot his SUV parked somewhere again, and I couldn't get lost on a road going one way. And, by pure chance, my crazy plan worked. I started walking down the dirt road, the summer sun nearly roasting me alive. But aside from that, the walk wasn't too bad. I could hear the splashing of families playing in the lake hidden by the trees. Birds chirped away, and when the wind blew, it cooled me down enough to keep walking. Well, I was about to turn around and head back when I heard a car start coming up the road. Turning my head, I saw a large SUV in the distance. Well, I started to feel excited. Something was going on, and I might be able to get some answers. Three SUVs drove past me each stopping half a mile from my position. I picked up my pace to walk over and see what was going on. Black figures came out from the cars and went into the woods. 
By the time I'd reached the parked cars, everyone was so far gone on the trail, I could no longer see them. No one remained by the cars, and I didn't get a good look at who had even just walked into the woods, let alone how many of them there were. At least I thought no one would stay behind. Oh, coming down the trail was the agent that had guided me out of the woods. He saw me, and it was hard to decipher his expression behind his sunglasses and at a distance. I raised my hand to give him a wave. He also raised his hand to make a shooing motion towards me. And as he walked closer, he scowled at me. I'm just taking a walk. I'm staying out of the woods. I told him in a bit too much of a smart-ass tone than I should. Don't press your luck, he hissed the moment he was close enough for me to hear him. And ignoring me, he walked over to one of the SUVs and opened the back door. He lifted a solid black box made from some sort of metal out of it. Well, his hands full, I did him a favour and closed the door for him. He glared down, eyes hidden. Well, can I help you carry anything? I offered, not thinking he'd take me up on it. Well, if you're going to lift this, I'll let you carry it to the meeting area. Setting the box down, he waited. Rolling up my imaginary sleeves, I bent over, confident in my noodle arms. Well, I couldn't even budge it, or get any kind of grip on the damn thing. My struggling was in vain. Well, the agent put me out of my misery, and picked up the heavy box from the ground with ease. Well, I felt as if he was teasing me. Well, I felt like being able to tease someone was probably something he was rarely able to do, so I let it go. Oh, I was just warming up. I said, sweat dripping from my face. He stared at me silently, most likely wondering how I'd survived, being as dumb as I was. Look, stay out of the woods. It's for your own good. Repeating his warning again, he turned to leave me behind as I completely forgot to ask about my little break-in. I could tell he wasn't going to tell me anything, even if I did. I felt like it was because he arrived with people, and if he'd been alone... He might have been more forgiving with his hints. Something was going on and I still didn't know a damn thing. I swore the moment I called off I was going to go down that trail and see what they were up to. So far it didn't look like they were hunting anyone, but I just couldn't deal with not knowing. Walking back to the cabin wore me out so much I nearly collapsed. The summer heat here was no joke. I took a quick cool shower so as to try and not get heat stroke. But by accident, I slept away the afternoon. God, how on earth did anyone wear a suit in this weather? When I woke up, I sat up confused at what time it was. Orange light was streaming in. I drew back the curtains to look outside and at the trees swaying in the wind. The cabin life wasn't all that bad, well, aside from strange animals breaking into my place. It was far too late now to walk down to the path and investigate, Instead, I did something I'd wanted to do since I'd arrived. I grabbed some beers and walked down the trail to the lake. If I could find the fishing poles, maybe I'd spend a few days just drinking and fishing. But only after I'd figured out the mystery who Agent 202 was, and what organization he worked for. When I came to the end of the short trail heading down to the lake, I stood staring in shock at the strange coincidences before me. This man really was everywhere in these woods. I saw the agent before he saw me. He was ankles deep in the lake, his shiny shoes up on the shore. Suit pant legs rolled up, trying to keep them dry but failing. He was filling up two watering cans with lake water. Because he was bent over, he didn't see me walk over. When he did raise his head, it looked like he was rolling his eyes behind his sunglasses. Don't look at me like that. I'm staying at my grandfather's cabin. You're the one invading my lakefront. He started towards me, his black hair slightly disheveled from his work. Well, oh, let's see, on this spot I could pull up the truck. Looking over, I spotted a brand new truck pulled up as close to the dock as possible without getting stuck on the downward slope towards the lake shore. In the truck bed was a half-filled water tank. Was he trying to fill that huge tank with just two of those little watering cans? As if reading my mind, he walked past carrying his full pails toward the truck. The pump's broken and we ran out of water. I'm not needed until later tonight, so this is busy work. 
he explained. Well, I had nothing else to do. I shoved the beers halfway into the sand and silently stood in front of him, my hand out to take a pail. He gave me a raised eyebrow, but still handed me one so I could help. I kicked off my sandals. We silently figured out a system of me refilling the pails by the time he came back from dumping one into an opening in the tank. We worked until the sun set, but there was still enough light left to see by. Oh, my back's killing me. Let's take a break. Oh, I'd barely done any work, but I still felt like I'd earned a beer. Getting out of the ankle-deep water, I sat down, regretting walking through the sand with wet feet. God, I'd never get that sand off. The beer was still a bit cool, though. I offered it to the agent, still working away filling his pails. He looked at me, then at the lake, considering my offer. When I shook the beer, trying to entice him, he finally gave in and walked over. Sitting down next to me, it appeared he didn't care in the slightest if his suit got covered in sand. He grimaced at the first swig of his drink, as if he didn't drink often. We didn't speak for a while, we just stared out to the peaceful water in the woods beyond it. He took off his sunglasses because it was too dark to see with them, cast a quick glance over at his face, trying not to be suspicious. Well, I hadn't seen his full face yet. He caught my eyes with his, catching me staring. Well, his eyes were blue. No, not a normal blue I'd ever seen before. No, his eyes were like the eyes of a dead man. I quickly looked away, suddenly frightened of him. I considered his eyes may look so dull because he had some sort of condition that affected his sight. Although well, he didn't seem to have any issues getting around. If he did, I felt a little ashamed of my reaction. What's your name? He asked me, dragging me from my thoughts. We'd never introduced ourselves when we met. Adam, I replied. I thought I saw a shadow of a smile on his face. Adam Anderson. Yeah, my parents named me after my grandfather. <laughs> They're not very original. You have a name? Well, it was meant as an innocent question that anyone should be able to answer. He didn't look over at me. Staring forward with his dead eyes on the lake, he took a sip of his beer, considering the question. Well, this hesitation made me nervous. It meant he might really not have a name besides Agent 202. Well, that was some really deep government-level stuff, if that was the truth. Being raised with a name to only do one job. I felt a feeling start to creep up my spine. As if I shouldn't know the very small amount of information I already did. From across the lake, lights started to flash in the woods. Bright ones as if someone was testing our spotlights somewhere from inside the trees. I... Is something bad going to happen? I asked quietly. No. Sacrifices are going to be made to keep the peace. I felt his cold eyes on me. I felt sweat starting to form at the base of my neck. Well, that one statement carried so much weight. I knew if I asked him to say any more, he'd refuse. I already knew far too much. A crackling static sound made him move his intense gaze from me towards the truck. He walked over to it and I forced myself to calm down a little. Reaching inside the open window, he pulled out a radio receiver to answer the call. Well, I eavesdropped, not knowing what was best for me. 202 here. A language I didn't know came through the static. The agent could understand what was being said, and scowled. Oh, damn it, of course. He arrived early. Oh, Hans is such an ass. All right, I'll be there. Keep him busy. With a small growl, he placed the radio back inside the truck and went around to get inside. I stood up, collecting his half-finished beer along with my own. I had enough state of mind not to litter the lakefront. Adam... Hearing him say my name was a little strange. Leaning towards the truck, I gave him my attention. I keep saying this, but stay out of the woods. His odd eyes bore into mine until I could no longer hold his gaze. I looked away, but nodded, showing I understood. I just wished I knew what was going on, that's all. Uh, it's human nature to be curious, but what's happening is not meant for you to know. So... 
please. He didn't need to repeat himself again. Whatever was happening was well beyond me. He was looking out for me by making sure I was going to stay away from the truth, and I fully planned on not letting it drop. As far as I could tell in that moment, there was nothing I could do. I watched as he pulled the truck out and away down the road, feeling a little bitter. I'd never fully know what he was warning me away from. Looking over, I saw more lights flickering in the woods, and sounds of music drifting along the lake. Well, the bugs were now making my exposed skin into a meal, so I headed back to the cabin, head still swimming with questions. The next day I found myself bored and pacing around the cabin. I'd seen more cars travelling down the dirt road, and through the trees the whole morning. I was going stir-crazy. Well, unless I left, I would go charging into those woods, trying to see what was going on. So I went into town instead. Unsure of how long I was going to be around for, I decided on signing up for a library card. Taking out books and movies should keep me away from boredom long enough to keep me out of trouble. I went through the process and was looking through their meagre movie section when I heard a voice call my name. Adam, is that you? I turned towards the voice to see a man around my grandfather's age. He looked confused for a moment before his face cleared. Oh, you must be his grandson. Christ, you look just like him when he was your age. Thought I was losing my marbles. I smiled at him, realizing he was a friend of my grandfather's. I abandoned the movie search and went over to him to introduce myself, even though it wasn't needed. I'd always known I was named after my grandfather, but I'd never once heard someone in the family call him Adam before. He went by his middle name of John, and that was what I knew him by. We shook hands and I followed the man to a sitting area. Oh, um, my grandfather broke his hip, so I'm cabin sitting. I got pretty bored up there, I explained. Uh, it does get boring there. Nothing much happens in this town at all. Suppose that's why some people like living here so much. Well, I started debating on if I wanted to bring up the topic of the strangers in the woods. Well, I've uh, been seeing men in suits around. Is it like an FBI training camp around here or something? A dark emotion flickered over the old man's face. I started to think I might have stepped on a landmine. He shook his head, trying to clear his thoughts and decide on his words. You and your grandfather are alike. <laughs> Years ago, he talked about the same thing. Men in the woods around his cabin. And? I leaned forward, heart beating, waiting for the man to finish. I was excited that I might get some answers and wondered why my grandfather had never mentioned any of this before. Ah, oh, he did the smart thing. Settled down with your grandmother and stopped looking into it. I couldn't help but let out a long sigh and leaned back in the oversized plush armchair. I was disappointed, and the older man started chuckling at me. <sighs> there was another reason why I stopped talking about it and carried on with your grandmother. Adam, your grandfather was the uptight suit-wearing kind of man. He came here from somewhere and the town thought he showed up looking for something. Mostly everyone thought he was a government man doing a land survey or something along those lines. What made him settle down here if he was an office type and not an outdoor kind of guy? Was it love at first sight when he saw my grandmother? I mused. Uh, love at first sight? Maybe, but not with your grandmother. He kept questioning the locals about men in suits appearing in the woods. He chased the leads around and we first thought he was a bit off his rocker, so a stranger came into town a few times. He wore a suit, but the other thing was, he bought all the live fishing bait and a massive amount of meals to go at the diner. We all assumed Adam, your grandfather, was chasing after answers. But after a set of campers caught him and the man wearing the suit in a uh, compromising position in the woods, we started to think otherwise. The man gave me a look over his glasses, and I knew what he was implying. I felt my face flush a little, and I knew why my grandfather didn't want to talk about the men in the woods. My family most likely didn't know anything about this. I almost felt like I was invading my grandfather's privacy in some way. Well, if he was, um, like that, why would he get with my grandmother? 
I married her because he also loved her. Anyone could see that. I'm sure he was happy with her, however, well, his eyes still looked towards the woods in a longing sort of way. Well, it always hurt to see it. I'm scared you're going down the same path. Look, ignore whatever's going on in the woods. It nearly ruined your grandfather, and the few locals that are aware of it pretend not to be. Now, you promised you'll stay out of it, right? I've seen one of those men wearing suits, but only once. Anyone with eyes like that isn't natural. He stopped talking then, drifting off deep in thought about a distant memory that still haunted him. I nodded, once again being warned off for my own good. All these warnings might keep me from going inside the woods, but I still wanted to go around asking questions. Now hearing that the locals tend to pretend as if nothing was going on, I doubted I'd get answers anywhere. Still, it might be worth a shot to start sleuthing a little. What else did I have to do all day? My grandfather's friend didn't look convinced that I'd behave. He did his duty and couldn't do much more if I decided to keep meddling. I kept telling myself I'd drop the matter, and little bits of information came up, luring me back in. We spoke for a little bit longer before he needed to excuse himself and be on his way. I picked out some books that I deep down knew I wasn't going to read. I tried speaking to the librarian while I was checking out the books about any strange events, and she couldn't think of any. She was kind enough to direct me towards the grocery store, saying they deal with all the residents in the small town, and they may know more than her. Well, I really should have dropped the entire thing, but I now knew men in suits had been around since my grandfather's time. How often did they appear? Only once since then? Or was this every other year? I should have called my grandfather, but he was still in the hospital, and I didn't want to disturb his rest any more than I needed to, and I doubted he'd tell me anything when I did call. Maybe ashamed of what he got up to before he met my grandmother. Well, then, if I couldn't figure out anything from the locals, I might go and see him as a last resort. The gas station and the grocery store were so close together, they might as well have been the same building. When I went inside, I grabbed something little to snack on. The cashiers weren't busy at all. While walking past the meat section, I saw it was nearly empty. That wasn't too strange in itself. I mean, they might have just had their delivery truck running behind. The teenage girl working at the cash register was close enough to the meat section to watch me look over the empty shelves, confused. Are you new to the area? She called out to me, startling me. I nodded and walked up to her. <laughs> what gave it away? Well, around this time of year, we have issues with the meat and the egg delivery. Because the locals know it, they buy what they need beforehand. What we have normally gets bought up for, like, this barbecue happening somewhere in the camping areas. She already rang up my single item, and I paused with my card in my hand, about to pay. A, um, barbecue? What do you mean? I asked, feeling as if I was finally getting somewhere. Well, what else could it be? It's got to be like um, company retreat or something. Business guys show up and buy all the meat and other stuff. It takes like two weeks to get stock back up after. Business guys, like men in suits? I said, carefully. Well, she nodded, but didn't seem too interested in her answer. I paid and she handed me my item. Not went to waste a bag, I just took it from her. Well, it's got to be a big company to buy so much food for people. Well, weirdly enough, like, this has happened since I was young. But I've never seen where they go. The camping sites aren't taken over, and there aren't any traces of a party. Well, maybe our prices are cheaper, so they buy stuff here and go somewhere else, she offered. I nodded. I mean, her theory was sound. If I hadn't seen the strange things the past two days, I might have agreed with her. On my way out, I noticed a box set up for people to donate food items. I placed my box of oatmeal bars inside of it on my way out. So I got some information from the trip, and it was worth it. Next, I headed over to the bait shop. If I ever wanted to go fishing, I'd need some new bait, after I'd found where my grandfather had hidden away the poles. Everything was in walking distance on the main street. I didn't see many people out as I walked down the street. So far, the locals either didn't notice the strange men about, or didn't see them as anything threatening. 
Well, I considered I was taking all of this out of context, and everything that was going on might have an innocent explanation. Hell, Agent 202 could be messing with me for all I knew. I was the one thinking what was going on was weird. He could be making it all appear more sinister just for fun, or to keep me off the track of the real answers. Inside the bait shop was empty, aside from an older man sitting behind the counter reading a magazine. He did a double take when I walked in. Setting aside his magazine, he looked as if he wanted to speak with me. Yeah, your name Anderson? He asked me. Yeah, I'm John's grandson, I told him while stepping in front of the counter. He looked a bit younger than my grandfather, but he still might know him. He looked me over again, a small smile forming on his face when he recognized my features. I look like him. He was a bit older when we first met, but I guess you look like he did when he was your age. How's he doing? I looked at his name tag to see the man's name was Darry. I scanned my memories to see if my grandfather had mentioned him before. Oh, then again, we had never spoken much before, and when we did, he liked to listen more than speak. A uh, hip broken, but as far as I know, he's doing all right. Actually, I've been meaning to call him. I might do when I get back to the house. As I spoke, I looked around the shop. The small fridge was empty of live bait near the counter. It was just as my other grandfather's friend had mentioned. For some reason, the men in suits came around and bought out bait, meat, and meals without the locals finding it strange. Oh, um, something got inside my place the other night. Well, I'm a city guy, so I'm not sure what it could have been. Do you know about any critters that can open doors? I wasn't sure what kind of questions I should ask, and this felt like a normal enough thing to inquire about. Well, uh, raccoon, most likely. Uh, if it was anything else, you'd know. Bears tend to be noticeable, and you wouldn't normally walk away from one barging inside your place. Your grandfather's always had issues with animals getting inside. Nah, he was never angry about it. He just had to replace doors pretty often. Oh, so this was a recurring event. My grandfather had never told me about it. Did he just hope that I wouldn't find out about these strange events until he got back? Well, he would have told me something if he'd wanted me to look into it. Or he could think I was smart enough not to poke my nose around like I currently was. Hey, uh, did you come in for bait? I'm out of the fresh stuff, but I can recommend some packaged ones. I snapped out of my train of thought and nodded. I let him guide me to the bait section and told me all sorts of information about different ones and what they were best for. Uh, it was all lost on me, but it seemed like he enjoyed talking to someone, so I listened. I picked out a package he recommended. When I did start fishing, I'd have to come back here for lessons. So, um, how does one run out of live bait? I asked while paying. Eh, about this time every year, we figure there's a big business getaway. Some guys in suits are coming and buy up everything we got. Must be a big company to need so much. It has to be one that's been in the family for years. I paused and watched his expression. That last statement was innocent enough, but the reasoning for it made Darry look a little embarrassed over thinking about it. I waited for him to keep going. When he noticed, he looked away. I've uh, lived here my entire life. I was younger when your grandfather showed up, but I remember something happened back then. The boy got lost in the woods and he was never found. The thing was, one of the business guys doing the retreat helped us look. See, the other day... Well, the weird thing was, I could have sworn I saw the same guy. He hadn't aged a day. Yeah, must be your grandson. I mean, you look like your grandfather. So whatever company's buying the bait every year must be a big one to afford it. And passed it down to their kids for the same looking guy to show up. I smiled at him, hoping I didn't look tense. Well, this was well worth the cost of the bait I'd just bought. I didn't know what I was going to do with this new information, but it was another piece to the puzzle that I was slowly putting together. Yeah, I think you're totally right on that, I said, trying to act normal. I heard a car driving slowly down the street. I thought it was a black one. Well, I got distracted and wanted to chase after it, but I didn't want to be rude to Darry. Yeah, when John comes back, tell him we need to go fishing again. I still owe him for what he did for me, after all. Darry was smiling, and I looked back at him. Black car forgotten. Oh, um, what did he help you with? 
He didn't tell you? He asked, looking a bit shocked. When I shook my head, he kept talking. I have a son, a bit older than yourself. He's never dated and rumors started to spread. It's a small town and some people have backwards ideas. When some local guys found out he was dating a man, they jumped him and nearly put him in the hospital. They went to the bar after, bragging about it. Didn't even know what happened, but somehow John found out. Walked right into the bar, rifle in hand. Without saying a word, he shot the ringleader in the foot and just beat the shit out of the other three. Well, I stood, speechless. I'd never heard anything about that. Aside from strange events in the woods, my grandfather kept a lot more secrets. With the town this small, I didn't understand how this wasn't the first thing I heard about when I introduced myself. <laughs> was he not arrested? I asked, dumbfounded. Because my son was dating the sheriff. I've had a smile come to my face. Sometimes small town cops looking the other way worked out for the better. Those guys should be thankful it was good old Grandpa John kicking their asses, and not the sheriff taking revenge for what had happened. Oh, he did have his guns taken away, so I doubt you still have any in the cabin, Darry explained. I hadn't checked the cabin for guns yet. That was a little embarrassing, considering something already had broken into the place. I was raised without them in my life, and even forgot in some places they were common. I honestly didn't even think about looking for some, but I'm glad to know that it would be a wasted effort trying to find them if I did. How's your son doing now? Oh, he's fine. He recovered, but the guys who beat him up all have limbs that haven't healed yet. Him and the sheriff got married shortly after it happened, because everyone already found out about them. Two years, and they're going strong. Two years. So this happened recently. Considering how old my grandfather was, it was impressive that he could still take out full-grown men at his age. Well, I'd really need to call him later and ask him about this. We spoke a little bit more before I promised to drop by again when I found the fishing poles. I gave Darry a wave out and started back down the main road, my stomach rumbling. Well, since I'd enjoyed the meal at the diner the last time, I thought having dinner there would be a good idea. Dark storm clouds were rolling in, threatening a storm. I might get caught up in it depending on how long my meal was. But I found a seat and ordered the meatloaf again. You're lucky we just made a fresh batch. The guy in a suit ordered nearly everything we had to be taken out and delivered somewhere. Gabby, my waitress, commented as she collected my menu. Oh, well, uh, where's it all going? I asked, hoping for any more scraps of information that I could get. Ah, not sure. Picked it up and loaded it all in his big car. Well, strange enough, he ordered fried eggs on almost everything. Well, I guess it'd work for meatloaf or some rice dishes, but on sandwiches? That ah, was weird. And I nodded. Well, at least I knew the agent liked fried eggs. The massive amount of food and cars going into the woods felt like a gathering of people was happening. But who and what did they arrive for? This wasn't a business retreat, that was for sure. You know, um, it doesn't sound too bad. Hey, would it be too much trouble adding a fried egg on the side of my meatloaf? And Gabby gave me a look but nodded her head with a small smile. It might be gross in the end, but I didn't like meatloaf and eggs, so it might not turn out to be too bad. And it wasn't. In fact, I enjoyed it. I might just try tossing an egg on top of everything within reason. Getting up after my meal went to the front to pay. As Gabby was giving me my change, I heard a rumbling outside. Well, the sky had gotten darker, and rain could come down at any minute. I wondered if I should just make a run for it, or maybe wait it out here a bit. Well, just then, the sheriff came in. I'd never met him, but I could tell who he was based on his uniform. Gabby, has Sally Ann come by recently? He asked, his voice sounding somewhat strained. Come to think of it, she hasn't. Well, she normally comes by to collect our bottles. What's up? And Gabby started to look a little worried. I got out of their way, but still listened in. Her mother hasn't been seen for a few hours. She's a little worried, and I've been checking around. So far, we haven't found anything. She's missing? Well, Gabby suddenly looked pale and nervous. Oh, no, I wouldn't go that far just yet. 
Maybe she just took a nap somewhere or just forgot to tell her mother where she was going. Uh, you know how she can be. But if she doesn't turn up soon, I'll get a group together to start looking. I felt stress start to build up in my guts. The agent's words came back to my mind about how sacrifices needed to be made. But if I brought that up now, I might be labelled as a nut. Aside from them being in town to buy bait and food, no one had seen the agents in the woods. Not only that, but a boy had gone missing before when my grandfather first arrived. This all didn't feel like a coincidence. I debated what to do. After all, I had no proof that they were responsible for the missing girl. She may have just wandered off and forgotten to call home. But a dark feeling was creeping into my thoughts, and I was unable to believe she was safe somewhere. Rain started to come down outside as more thunder rumbled. We all looked out of the window, worried about the missing girl and praying she was somewhere safe. I offered my services to the sheriff if he needed someone to go looking with him. He thanked me, telling me he'd keep me in mind, and hurried off to the next spot to check. Rain was starting to come down now. Not hard, but I was soaked by the time I got back to the cabin. I got changed into some dry clothing. My stomach twisting from the stress. Going outside, I saw the sky was getting darker by the second, and I worried about that missing girl. If she was out there, she'd be in a bad spot when the rain came down. And what if those agents did take her for something? Well, 202 didn't seem like the type, but I couldn't vouch for the others. I wanted to talk to my grandfather about everything I'd learned. Since he was staying so far away, I called the hospital. I didn't want to leave for an entire day trip while the girl was missing. I found that I couldn't reach him. He tried to get out of bed too soon after his hip surgery and was rushed back in to get the damage fixed. That had been a few hours ago. My father was the emergency contact. The hospital would have no reason to call me and I assumed my father didn't want to stress me out until he knew what was going on. Oh, with speaking to my grandfather no longer being a current option, I decided there was only one thing left to do. I was going into the woods. The sun hadn't set, but it was dark and overcast by the time I was ready to leave again. I found an oversized raincoat and a flashlight. I didn't own any boots, so my feet would get wet on this trip. Double checking, I made sure I had my cell phone and braved the storm outside. Walking down the dirt road, I kept slipping on the mud and watched for any cars. There weren't any tracks due to the rain, and I didn't see any parked SUVs like I had before. The path was so hidden without the SUV marking it, I nearly walked right by it. Gathering up my courage, I walked along being careful not to trip. The forest felt like a living creature that didn't want me being near it. The trees felt as if they were closing in on me out of the corners of my eyes. Each lightning flash brought more fear and stress. I thought I was seeing shadows darting between the trees. An unnaturally cold wind blew and my teeth chattered from fear. I didn't know what this girl looked like. Well, I assumed I'd just run into Agent 202 again. Or he might answer my questions if it was about a missing girl. I felt like he was a decent man, just stuck with a menacing job. I'd only been in the woods for a short while, but I was already fairly lost. Hearing rustling behind me, I looked over, trying to see the cause of this noise. At first, I didn't notice it. Then, movement barely within my eyeline made me look up. On a tree branch over nine feet in the air was what looked like a wet sleeping bag. I looked at it confused about how it had gone up there and why anyone would put it there. And then I realized it looked full, not like an empty sleeping bag draped on a tree branch. The moment that realization hit me, the upper part of the bag turned towards me. A pure white face looked down at me, nearly all of it been taken up by a twisted smile. I nearly dropped my flashlight when I bolted. I didn't even scream, I just ran as fast as I could away from whatever I'd just seen. While I ran in a mad panic, I saw more of those shapes in the trees, and jumped over a few in the bushes. They looked like they were wrapped in fabric, but almost had a caterpillar body. Nubs acting like feet started to move when I ran past. 
I didn't look behind me. I just ran for my life. Aside from their faces, they didn't look all that frightening. I didn't know if they were just a joke or some sort of forest creature. I wasn't sticking around to find out. As I ran, I started to hear the voices. Small voices carried on the wind, nearly drowned out by the pattering of the rain on my jacket hood. Stay. Offering. Wait. Wait. The raspy voices begged me not to leave them behind. I wasn't going to listen to them. I tripped over a root and smashed into the ground. My knee shot pain through my entire body, and my elbow got that fuzzy feeling from hitting my funny bone. I couldn't breathe, so I curled up against a tree, trying to recover. I sat wheezing, sore and cold, and scared out of my mind. The rain was a drizzle, but thunder rumbled. I could hear them. The sound of their bodies moving in the woods. The same rustling sound I thought was wind through the trees when I first ran into 202. These things have been in the woods the entire time. I didn't know if one had broken into my kitchen or if it was something else. Gopping down air, I was ready to run again when I saw a pale face peek out from the bushes and smile at me from a few feet away. What the hell was happening in these woods? I never ran so much and so hard in my life. The lack of oxygen to my brain made me dizzy. I could have been going in circles for all I knew. I flew into a clearing, tripping over my own feet, falling hard onto the ground. I stayed panting while rain started to drizzle down harder. The sky was so grey it was as if the sun had already set. I looked up, sweat and rain dripping down my face. My throat raw from running. Beyond the clearing I saw a shape and my heart nearly stopped. But I breathed a sigh of relief when the head raised up so I could tell it was just a harmless deer. It looked at me, wary. Because I didn't move or get closer, it regarded me as harmless though. The thing waiting above the deer, however, most certainly was not. A blur of motion came from the tree and the thump of it landing on the deer's back made my skin crawl. But well, for some reason the deer didn't run. It let out a horrible sound of distress and collapsed so I could no longer see the deer or the creature that had landed on top of it. So I waited, entire body tense. A ripping sound drifted between the sound of rain and the deer which remained silent. Finally, after hearing hints of something horrible happening, more tearing sounds came as a new creature stood up. It looked a little like a deer. But it had a human face and legs. So many legs along a body covered in fabric. I gasped, and it looked at me. The smile so wide its eyes were scrunched up. Again, I didn't stay to see what the hell was going on. I scrambled back to my feet and started running. My chest was burning, but those creatures in the woods were a very good motivation to keep going. I heard the new deer-like creature start after me. The bushes and the tree branches were knocked aside as it moved. More of the creatures fell out of the trees, landing on the ground with wet-sounding thuds. Some behind me, some in front. I kept moving while those thuds came from behind. And after each sound of impact, small feet started after me. I was being chased by these creatures, and I didn't have any way of ditching them. Uh, in such a situation, you can understand why I did something so desperate as to run towards the first artificial lights that I saw. Through the trees on my left, there was a blinding light. I changed course and ran towards it. I nearly tripped over one of those caterpillar-shaped things on the way. I heard their little footsteps getting closer and closer. God, I wasn't going to make it. I even felt the breath of a larger one on my neck as I ran. With one final push, I launched myself into the light, rolling along wet, cut grass. Panting, scared out of my wits, I sat up, mouth open to beg for help. And I froze. My entire body shut down at what I saw. It was a circle completely cleared of trees and trimmed grass. Spotlights had been set up to surround the area, 
and shone directly into the middle of the clearing. Men in suits stood an equal distance from each other. I'd just run into the middle two of them, making them stare at me in utter confusion. All of them had black hair and looked very similar to the agent I'd met. An agent at the far side started to run towards me the moment I sat up. It was my guess he was Agent 202, running to get me the hell out of what I'd just stumbled into. The two in the middle of the clearing were so unnatural that my brain just stopped working. I sat staring in shock at a creature at least twelve feet tall. It looked a little like the creatures in the woods that I was running from. A dark, shining fabric covering its long body, making it look as if it was covered in oil. It curled around itself, a human-like face looking towards me, giving me that same unsettling smile that the other monsters had. Instead of the stubby arms, this monster's body was lined with human arms down the side, far too many for me to count. The smile grew even wider the longer it looked in my direction, to the point where it looked as if it was going to take up its entire face. The man in black beside the creature was so surprised at my sudden arrival, he dropped a black metal box he was about to hand to the monster. The box tipped over, spilling out gore and blood into the wet grass gore kept spilling out, spreading beyond them. It was as if it was never going to stop, pouring from such a small space, too. Oh, what a treat. The creature got down and flew towards me quickly, using its countless hands to tear up clogs of dirt and grass. I was unable to move or save myself. Right before a large mouth tore into my body, I was suddenly pushed aside. The monster instead grabbed my saviour. It kept going, now with a man wearing a suit locked in its jaws. They both slammed against a tree, causing the rest of the men wearing suits to scatter, looking confused about what to do. I felt sick. Without doubt, my life had just been saved by 202. He'd just sacrificed himself after he'd warned me again and again to stay out of these woods. But he was still alive pinned against the tree as the monster tore into his shoulder, blood staining the ground. He was trying in vain to get the jaws away from him. Face twisted in pain, he looked over in my direction, silently begging me to run. Oh, my legs were so unstable. Powerful arms suddenly lifted me, painfully off the ground. One of the men in suits was now facing me, face twisted in so much rage he might as well have been foaming at the mouth. You... Do you have any idea what you've just done? Hans, drop that trash and come over to eat this one, he snapped. The monster looked in our direction, the agent still dangling from its mouth. Oh, bring the newcomer over here. A voice came, and it made everyone stop moving. They all looked as scared as I felt. The man who was flushed in rage a second ago now paled. I looked over to see whose voice it was. Past where the blood and gore it was still pooling from the box, there was a white shape. It was so white my eyes hadn't seen it when they were adjusting to the glaring spotlights. It looked like a layer of nearly transparent sheets piled on top of each other, being held up by one point underneath. The voice was so pleasant and the fabric looked inviting but the thought of going near it scared me far more than anything else I'd seen so far. The man recovered and started to drag me along. I finally regained some senses to resist them, but they were too strong. I was dragged along, getting blood soaked through my shoes when we went through it. I felt sick. I prayed that the missing girl wasn't a part of that gore pile. We stopped and the layer of fabric opened up just enough for me to see a pair of feet. Clawed, segmented feet as pale as the glossy sheets they hid behind. Oh, what a troublesome family you are. The voice was soft, but it made my body react in the same way that nails on a chalkboard would. My lord, should you really be... One of the men who held me on my feet started to ask. Are you questioning me, child? The soft voice called him. 
I felt his hand shake as he kept holding onto my upper arm. Who... What the hell are you? I asked, voice trembling so hard I barely got the words out. That is none of your concern, the voice answered me. Yes, it is. I turned my head to see Agent 202 still hanging from the monster's mouth. His body turned to face us, blood dripping off his black suit. Well, um, as of an hour ago, this man is the landowner. We need his permission to... The creature tightened its jaws shut. I heard bones cracking as the agent fell limp, no longer able to speak. I nearly got sick seeing such a thing. I shook, but out of rage from someone I was starting to consider a friend being killed in front of me. My grandfather owned land around the cabin, and I never knew just how much was his. And if I was now the owner, then that meant my grandfather had passed away. But how would they know about his death before me? I needed answers. Feeling a bit braver because of my anger, I turned back towards the hidden figure. But I demand to know what he was talking about, and why that creature just killed him. I wanted to sound intimidating, but the tears in my eyes ruined it. Oh no, 202 is not dead. It takes more than that to kill one of my children. But I suppose I do need to explain a few things to make this evening valid. Lifting the veil like fabric, I saw more of the one who was speaking to me. They had a slim body dressed in glimmering white layers. A pair of thin legs peeked from the cut of the dress-like outfit. These pale legs looked as if they should belong to a ball-jointed doll with claws for feet. Their face was still hidden, the chest somewhat flat, making it impossible to really tell a gender. We require permission from the owner of the land so we can do our yearly meetings. In an exchange, I shall give the landowner anything they wish for. The creature whispered towards me. He reached a hand out and touched under my chin with just the tip of a clawed finger. A warm feeling spread through my body, like I'd just sunk into the most relaxing bath ever. My eyes closed and my head dropped. If I hadn't been held up, I would have fallen asleep from that slight touch. In the back of my mind, I wondered what it would feel like if this creature had placed its entire hand on my shoulder. And I shook the cotton from my head when the fingertip was drawn away. That agent, if he's still alive, you get him medical attention. I mumbled, pulling myself out of that warm feeling and back into the coldness of the real world. Oh, that's it? The voice asked, sounding less graceful than before. I kept shaking my head, trying to think. I did say I could ask for anything. That might mean more than one thing. I could try and save 202 because he'd saved my life. If he lived through this, though, he would go back into this creature's clutches. His lonely dead eyes haunted my thoughts, and I knew I couldn't leave him behind. I wonder... I want you to give Agent 202 his freedom. Let him leave and do whatever he wants with his life, I said sternly, finally finding my strength. I heard an intake of air from inside the small tent. The creature sounded angry. His entire body froze and I felt my chest tighten in fear. I felt as if I had just done something very, very wrong. You just asked for one of my children. You dare ask a parent to give up a child? His voice rose with each word until the air itself around us shook. The fabric flared out behind it, giving it an appearance of wings flapping in the wind still covering its face. When I thought I couldn't take it anymore, the thing waved a pale hand. Ah, oh, done. I have hundreds more. Anything else, small-minded child? My head was swimming. I was about to say no because I really didn't want anything from these damned monsters when the reason why I'd entered the woods came to mind. Oh, um, if Sally Ann is still alive, please spare her and don't harm anyone from town. <sighs> we don't harvest in the area we meet. That's a given. It appears the owner before you told you nothing. 
Now I do not have any more time to waste. Be gone from my sight. Another wave of its hand, and I was being dragged back by the men in suits. As I was being dragged, I felt a small, sharp pain in my arm, causing me to look over. One of them had just jabbed me with a needle. I looked at him, offended. Pretend this entire thing was a dream and stay the hell away from now on. His hissed voice was barely above a whisper. When he was finished speaking, whatever he jabbed me with took over. My body fell limp, and I dropped into a long, dark sleep. When I awoke again, my entire body was stiff. I felt like I'd slept for days, and I later learned on that I had. Outside was a ruin of downed tree branches and dead trees. My phone line was dead, and my cell phone wasn't charged. When I got it working again, I gathered up whatever information I could and listened to my hundreds of missed messages from my family. A huge storm rolled in, cutting out the phone lines and the power in the area the day I went into the woods, so no one had been surprised when I didn't return their calls. Because of the damage, none of my family members could drive over to the cabin and see me. Well, I already knew that my grandfather had passed away and had left the cabin to me, but hearing it was still a shock. I made arrangements to get everything settled. I walked into town to get something to eat and found out that Sally Ann was perfectly fine. She'd hitched a ride to the town over to get a special birthday present for her mother. Her phone had died, and she didn't remember her mother's cell number to borrow a friend's phone to call. She felt so bad about everyone worrying about her that she was still apologizing for it. When I got back to the cabin after going into a brief trip into town, I saw a familiar SUV waiting for me. I was only drugged and sleeping for three days, but the agent I asked to be saved had already recovered from injuries that should have killed him. He leaned against his car, watching me approach, eyes hidden behind his glasses. Well, he looked fine, dressed in a new suit. Aside from a set of new scars on his face, a line ran up from the corner of his mouth, up under his glasses, and cut through his eyebrow on both sides of his face. Another line started under the bottom corner of his mouth, giving it a segmented look. When I stopped a few steps away from him, he silently stared, the air tense between us. He then stood up, hands in his pockets. And without a word, he gave my foot a kick with the side of his polished dress shoes, with a scowl on his face. Oh, you're just like your grandfather. Can't leave well enough alone. Gotta go chasing after nonsense. I could tell he was angry from his side kicking me, and I took it. I could have died because I didn't listen to him. Well, hearing him mention my grandfather made me wonder how old 202 really was. When he was finished kicking me, he turned his back on me. I thought he was just going to leave, but he spoke again. Is he really gone? He asked finally. Yeah, I'm sorry, I replied, and I meant it. This man might have known my grandfather better than even I did. If he was as old as I thought, he'd made the hard choice of leaving someone he cared about behind as he started a family and the agent kept doing his mysterious job with unnatural creatures. So, um, that big monster thing that nearly ate me was Hansa. Huh, he really is an ass. His back was still turned, and he gave a snicker, and eased some of the tension. What are you going to do now? Keep the cabin? I'll do the wise thing and sell it, he asked, looking over his shoulder at me. Oh, I don't think I could do that to someone. You guys are stuck with me for a while, I guess, I said, shrugging. Oh, you should do what your grandfather did. Raise a family and keep his nose out of things that's none of his business. You are my friend. You are my business. It was a little embarrassing to say, but even more so to hear. The agent stared at me, mouth slightly open as color started to come to his ears. Trying to hide his reaction, he started his side-kicking again, a bit harder this time. But I couldn't help but laugh as I stepped away, trying to dodge his pitiful attacks. Ah, go get married he yelled, raising a finger at me and then stomped over to his SUV. Yanking open the door, he started the car but didn't drive off just yet. After a few seconds, the window came down and he leaned out a little. 
I'm going to see you next year. Well, you can drop by whenever you want, I offered. Oh, um, hey, do you have a real name? Like, 202 is a mouthful. He sat, thinking about how to answer. I said, nah, my parent has a lot of children. They ran out of names after 30 of us, so, um, no. You can give me a nickname. The offer was so sudden I wasn't able to think of one on the spot. I searched through my mind, trying to come up with anything. The seconds dragged on and I picked the first thing I could think of. Um, Thule, I mean, <laughs> it's a real surname and it kind of sounds like two, well, sort of. I felt embarrassed by my horrible naming skills. God, you're just as bad at naming as my parent. Hans is called that because it sounds like Hans. It's so stupid, I said, knowing I wasn't much better. Well, truly it is, I guess. No, wait, no, I changed my mind. Give me a second, I can think of something better. Nope, oh, gotta go. See you later. I stood helpless as he drove away, leaving me in the dust. Oh, he could have died of embarrassment. I was only alive because of this man, and I'd given him the world's worst nickname in exchange. Well, until I saw him again, when I would think of a better one. After all, whatever that was in those woods would be coming again. So when I'm like adding the titles to videos like this, I always think of, you know, how can I describe it? Lost in the woods, secret agent, um, zombie, <laughs> whatever it is. And this one, I've got to admit, I have absolutely no idea. What on earth was that all about? Um, enjoyed it all the same, but uh, couldn't think of a way to describe that one easily. Any thoughts, feelings about that? Uh, leave them in the comments section below the video, and you might just help me to name this one. Well, that's it for... God, what is Wednesday already? These days just click, click around, don't they? Well, it'll be a podcast tomorrow evening, and I'll be back again here on Friday. Till the next time, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dreams, and bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.